On Wednesday evening, we began taking a look at Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. In what we call chapter 1, we saw that Paul commanded or commended his members of that body, telling them how he really appreciated the things that they were doing in his absence in that area. In chapter 2, we saw a bit of a history of Paul's work that led to the establishment of the body. In chapter 3, we saw about Paul's reason for sending Paul or T Timothy to Thess Thessalonica. And then in chapter 4, which is a continuation of this letter, we're going to start picking up where we left off at that particular time. During that time that Paul had written and the things we looked at, one of the things that he had worked on was the sexual immorality of the time. The problems that he saw because these people were living in a region that were really terrible when it came to things like that. And he commended the church. He said, you know, you weren't like that, but I'm wanting you to realize that you have to be careful because if you're not careful, this could creep into the body. It's happened in many churches. I've heard of several times, I think Brother Johnson brought out one day about pastors who wound up having relationships with other people in the congregation. I remember when I was in seminary down in Little Rock, Arkansas, there was a man that I highly, highly appreciated and I loved him and uh, I admired him for what I thought was his testimony. And when I came up here, I found out that the man was no longer in that position because he had had an affair with somebody. We have to be careful because the world that surrounds us can get into our body. And Paul warned them about that even though they were doing so well. And that their testimony had spread out, not just in their location, but spread out all over the region that they lived in. But he said, I want to tell you something. I want you to do even better than what you're doing now. We can't be settled with what we're doing today. We've got to keep on working because as time goes on, times get worse. You know, there are those religions that say as time goes on, it's going to be a revival and things are going to get better. But then why is there going to be a tribulation period? we got to stop and look at reality. He reminded them about the necessity of being honest. And he mentioned them that the Holy Spirit lives within them and gives them guidance to keep them free from the domination that sin can have in their lives. We need to take a look at that. If we allow the Spirit to have His way in our lives, we can be free of those kind of things that creep in. We need to be careful. Another thing that he mentioned and that he said he knows that they had this, but it ought to get better, is brotherly love. He said, not just brotherly love within your local body, but he said also the brotherly love ought to reach out beyond the body into the surrounding areas. Paul had two main things in his mind. He could live and he could serve God on earth. Or number two, he could die and be with the Lord. How many of you are excited about thinking about what life is going to be like when we leave this life? <laughs> this has been one of those hectic two weeks. I've seen enough doctors to fill this many fingers on my head. And each one told me something that they felt was wrong. And you know what? I'm looking forward to that day. Nothing serious. I'm still alive. But you know, the Apostle Paul, 
If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. He said, it's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Otherwise, he experienced things up there. When he was up there and saw all that was going on up there, he couldn't even find words to explain what he saw. You say, well, he said he wasn't sure who this man was. How do we know that it was him? Well, in verse 7, he stated that he had a problem. Satan was allowed to put something in his life that made his life a little bit miserable. And he went to the Lord three times and asked the Lord, take it away from me. Get rid of it. And God told him, look, just trust me. I'll take care of it. And when you get to the point where you can't take care of yourself, you'll find out just exactly how strong I am. Because then my power can be felt in your life. And Paul said, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. God allowed something to come into his life because he had seen things that no other man had ever experienced. But you know, sometimes when we get educated, our head grows very largely. We look down on people because they're not as intelligent as we are. I'm sure we've all met people like that. So Paul said, because of what I have seen, what is being revealed to me, I was allowed to have this. Now, what could he possibly have seen that would put him on such a tear? I believe he's describing the man that was caught up into paradise. His thoughts about the future bounced between two things in life, which he disclosed in Philippians 1, 22 through 24. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Think about that. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You know, so many people that I know down through the years who knew Christ as personal Savior feared death. Why? Why do we fear death? All of the things that surround us in seem to tear us down so much. Health issues, stress, all these things when we go to be with the Lord are gone. And then I, in my years of pastoring and working with the Lord, I've come across those that got mad at God because he allowed somebody in their lives to die that were saved. And he was angry with God because he said, say, I prayed for him. I prayed for her. I wanted to see him heal. You know what my answer is for that? God already has healed them. No longer are they in this pain and agony that they had been going through for so long. God healed them. They're with him. They no longer have to go to these expensive doctors. 
and they no longer have to lay in those beds with things hooked into their arms, having to use a wheelchair to get where you want to go, not having to use a cane anymore where you go. So it says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Otherwise, doing what I'm doing with you, this is what God wants me to do. I'm happy with it. Yet, what I choose, I want not. For I am straight between two things. Having a desire to depart. Now listen to this. And be with Christ. Have you ever stopped to think about that? What is it going to be like as we pass from here to there and be greeted by the one and only Son of God who died for us to make it all possible. Have we really thought about that? Are we living our lives looking forward to that? Being with Christ is far better, he says. Now look at this. Look at his attitude here. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul was not a selfish man, as many saved people we find out are like in this day and age. Sometimes people who claim to have Christ put everybody else to the side and are concerned about themselves. But Paul said, look, I would rather be with Christ, but I'm happy for where I am now because I can help you. He knew the turmoil that they were going through. He knew all the circumstances surrounding them. He knew that they were in a very black area as far as life is concerned. But he still wanted to be with him. To help them. We saw in the early part of the, this letter to the church. That Paul was preparing them for what was ahead. One day. Things were going to happen to them. Their future. Was the same as what has happened to the ones who had died. Before them. They were going to be facing death one of these days. And the problem that they were having, some of them did not understand what happened to those once that body went into the grave. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or which have died and their bodies are in the grave. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to misunderstand what's going on. I want you to understand what's really taking place. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Don't feel bad about your loved ones who have died knowing Christ. That's what he's telling you even as others who have no hope. Your loved ones who have died, he said, they are living the hope or the expectation that we look forward to the day that we go to be with Christ. So don't feel sorry for them, he says. I want you to understand this. That word ignorant is not what we uh, understand in our language today. Today, it's sarcasm to tell somebody that they're ignorant. But it just simply means that they were uninformed about what has happened to those people whose body has died and was buried. 
And by knowing the true facts about what has happened to their loved ones, there was no need for them to feel sorry for them because they died. Think about it. Oh, I realize that, yeah, when somebody dies, that it does for us because we miss them. But if we know Christ as our personal Savior and they knew Christ as their personal Savior, we're going to have a get-together one of these days. In verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which also sleep, those who have died, their bodies have been placed in the grave, in Jesus will God bring with him. They're coming back. They're not going to touch here the first time around, but they're coming back with their Savior, with God. We have hope. We have an expectation. In verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before prevent them which are asleep or those whose bodies are in those graves right now. Think about this when you think about death of a loved one. Death of a loved one who knows Christ is like what happened to me when I felt that the Lord was leading us to go to seminary. I had to leave behind all of my family that I even knew in Pennsylvania to go to Arkansas. I had a mother, a mother-in-law, father-in-law. My daughter had just been born just a short time before that and we had to leave. But you know what? One day they came to see us again. Death is like that. When a person dies, his spirit goes to be with the Lord and we, it's like them taking a trip and we one of these days know that we're going to take that same trip. We're going to go to the same place they went. We'll see them again. In verse 16, For the Lord himself shall be sent from heaven with a shout. Oops, I'm not supposed to do that. No, I told me. Don't do that. With a, thank you, sir. With a shout. With the voice of the archangel. With the trump of God. Now listen to this. Listen to this. And the dead bodies that are in the grave shall rise first. Immediately, when the Lord calls those bodies are coming out of that grave. They're not there anymore. There's no need to put flowers on those graves anymore. They're gone. In verse 17, here's the part, folks. Listen, listen, listen carefully. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds where? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh, here's marvelous part of this. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Does that do anything for you? How does that make you feel this morning thinking about those words? So shall I. Make it personal. So shall I ever be with the Lord. That makes me want to yell, but it's not a good idea. Doctor told me not to. Why do 
we feel yes. We all know that one of these days we're going to have to face it. Look forward to it. Be like Paul. Yeah, I want to be here because I've got a relationship with my family and I know that when, when I leave, you know, it's going to leave a vacancy in their lives. So I, I, I want to be content here. But man, when it's my time to go be with the Lord, I'm ready to go. I tell people sometimes that the reason that I'm still here today after my stage three cancer is that God still wants to get even with some people and he keeps me around to do his job for him. Life is interesting. Life has got a purpose for us. God gives us a time to be here. But then, finally, the time comes that it's time, now listen to this, to go home. I used to look forward to going back to see my family in Pennsylvania. I miss them drastically. This summer I may have probably see my brother for the last time, last time. Because I know he's got a lot of health issues and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, this is probably the last time I'm gonna be able to make this trip. And I can't make the trip back there. I remember when I went to see my mother for the last time when I was pastoring here, I took two weeks with my mother in Pennsylvania. And I remember how I felt as I walked out the door that last time. I knew that was the last time I'm going to see my mother on this earth. Because one of the last things we talked about, Mom, do you really know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? She said, yes, I do. I'll see you again. I came back to Buchanan. Within a few days, I got a call from my aunt. She said, you can come back. Mom's gone. I know the feeling. I know what it's like. My dad lived in Texas. I lived up here. Dad died. I couldn't be with him. But I know where he is today. Because I know the day that he was here was the last time I saw him. He was here. And when he left, he said, we have a church down there like this one. He said, I'll start going. After I had taken him to the airport, I came home from the airport, got in the mailbox, pulled out the mail, and there was the uh, newsletter that came from the seminary, and then there was a friend that I had gone to school with down in uh, Arkansas. And his name was in there. He had a mission right near where my dad was. I called him and I said, would you mind going and talking to my dad? He said, I'd be glad to. My dad went back to church, rededicated, rededicated his life to Christ and served him for the last five years of his life. You know what? I can't wait to give my dad a hug again. He had no legs, but helped to build a baptistry in the church and put the walls up in the building. I'm going to see that dad one of these days again. What was Paul telling them? Only their bodies are dead. Their spirits are with the Lord in heaven. One of these days, Jesus will come back in the clouds and call all of those dead bodies out to the grave and they will go up to meet Jesus in the clouds and be reunited with their spirits. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52, Paul wrote, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, 
the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What does that mean? There is no more deterioration of me when I leave this earth. No more death. No more illness. Wherefore, comfort one another with these things, he tells his people. When you see somebody that has lost a loved one who knows Christ, comfort them. Don't pity them. Comfort them. Remind them of what we're learning here this morning. Take these words to them. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear in person, face to face, we shall be like him as he is. In Job 19, 25, and 26, Job said, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, <laughs> yet in my flesh I shall see God. And though after my skin worms destroy this body and he repeats, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Bob, explain that to me. I can't. A preacher says he can't play it. We've got one better than any preacher that we're going to see face to face. And he, if he really thinks it's important to us, and I don't think we will really care about that. You know, sometimes I, I remind myself that I am going, you know, to people and I say, boy, the first question I'm going to ask Jesus is this. I got news for you. I don't think we're going to be concerned about things that we didn't know here because we got the teacher up there that's going to bring those things to light when we get there. We don't have to ask you, well, what do you mean about this in the Bible? Of course, we don't want to ask him that question because he'd probably tell us, well, if you had studied it, you would know. Do I get an amen out of that? No, there are some questions. Folks, this is something we need to sit down with our children and our grandchildren and talk to them about. One of these days, mom and dad are going to die. One of these days, grandma and grandpa are going to die. And mom and daddy, grandma or grandpa, they have received forgiveness of sin and they placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And when they die, they're going to go be with God. And if you want to see them again, let me tell you how you can look forward to seeing them again someday. I remember when Shelly was little and I was pastoring her. And I used to do, Brother Johnson probably too, I used to do a ton of funerals in this area. It seemed like every time, you know, somebody died, they didn't have a pastor. This phone would ring. And I remember I would take Shelly along to the funeral and she didn't sit in the back. She was introduced to death. We need to introduce our children, our grandchildren, to the fact of death and what it's all about. In John chapter 20 and verse 19, you want to know what Jesus was like after the resurrection? Well, John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, 
when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith to them, Peace be unto you. How did he get in there? What kind of body did he have that he got in there? What was he when he got in there? We'll find out. Stay tuned for future editions. But notice his words. Peace be unto you. He told them several times, my peace I give unto you. He's given us all the facts that we need to help us to address the days that we face that seem scary. This letter continues in what we call chapter 5. And let me remind you as I did Wednesday night. This is not a book with chapters. This is a letter that is to be read verse by verse all together so that we understand where the writer is coming from in all that he's written. All the things that we had seen up till now was leading up to something that was going to take place. And this letter continues in what we call chapter 5. Paul doesn't stop with these few words of comfort that we have read up to this point in this letter. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he goes on to tell them that there's no need to try to figure out when all this is going to take place. People sit down with preachers, sit down in Sunday school classes. How do we know it's going to take place? Well, you know what? If we study and we live the way God wants us to live, we won't have to worry about when it's going to take place. That's what Paul tells them. He says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as the seed from the land. You don't need anything else to be told to you. Here's your answer. Be ready. He's not going to get up there with a megaphone and say, I'm coming tomorrow morning. Be ready. He said, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There will be no warning when Jesus comes for those who are saved. But the lost people who are left behind are going to find themselves here on earth all alone without the people that they knew who were saved. But they're going to experience some things. They think things are bad now. You wait until that day comes and we're gone. Oh, they didn't like us and they can say goodbye as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to be here with them then. Terrible things are going to start taking place for them. But the saved will be in heaven rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. Now we're going to begin to see why Paul presented a reminder of all these things throughout this letter up to this point. Let's look at what he tells these people in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 5. Ye are the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. He says, you have been enlightened about what is going to take place. You have all the information that you need so that you can prepare for when I, when Jesus comes back. They should be ready for that marvelous event that's going to take place. They're not in the dark. They're the ones that are living in the light. 
I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life that cometh. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But then he also says, I am the light of the world. This book that we have, that's our lights. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's everything that I need to get me through this dark world. Therefore, now look at this, let us not sleep. Now this is talking about be out of touch with what's going on. Let's not just shut our eyes to what's going on around us and forget about it. We need to look at this, showing us that the time is coming. I want to tell you something, as we look at the global things that are going on, in our world today, we have now a global organization that tells us how we are to live physically and what we are allowed to do physically and what we are not allowed to do physically. That is a global organization. We now have a global organization that is starting to begin to get things together as a financial caring group. Telling us China right now is dealing with the, what do they call that, the Bitcoin or whatever it is. They're working with that. These Bitcoins and all this new kinds of money come out. It's not American money. It's global money. Think about it. We have a president right now. He doesn't want us to be United States citizens. We are global people. We belong to this world. No, I am an American. Amen. God gave us this nation. God gave us what we have. And we ought to stand for it. Or we're going to be made accountable for, for sitting down and allowing him to get away with what he's doing. We have a vote coming up. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Now, verse 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, drunken in the night, only the lost are going to be called off guard. They live in the dark world of sin. They have rejected Christ. They keep on with their dark, sinful habits that they have chosen in place of accepting the Lord's offer of salvation from what is next on the list of things that are about to take place. You know, Noah was a preacher. I don't believe, I don't know about you, Brother Johnson, but I'll tell you what, I don't believe that while Noah was building that ark, he just had his mind just on that ark. I believe that those, those people came by and they saw him building that ark. I believe he preached to them about why he was building that ark. But they rejected him. They rejected his message. And what was the outcome? Every one of them died with the exception of his family. Brother Johnson was talking in the Sunday school class about the flood that overtook the entire, the highest mountain was gone. And so were all the lives that rejected the message that they received. Look at verse 8 in chapter 5. But let us who are of the day, otherwise those of us who are saved, those of us who know what is ahead, those of us who know what pleases God, let us who are of the day be sober or have good senses, have good judgment, have good wisdom, and the act of being level-headed. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope or that promised expectation that what God said was going to happen, where I'm going to go, keeping that in our focus at all times. Now 
salvation or deliverance. Now, if you know what's coming ahead and what he says, you'll know what he means about of salvation. We as born again believers in Christ are going to be delivered from what's about to take place when the Lord comes back to take us home. Things are going to change. Here's a promise that some people ignore when they feel that the Lord's people will go through the horrible things known as the tribulation period. We're not going to be here. At least I'm not going to. God's given me some promises. We read, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake, which means alive, or asleep, physically dead, we should live together with him as children of God, believers in Christ. We will not be here for that seven years of tribulation because God has appointed us to that wrath. We're born. Therefore, comfort or encourage each other, edify, build up one another. Just as you also are already doing. Now here's another commendation we saw. Like the ones in the beginning. He commends them that they're loving their brothers. And it's good. But you know what? Don't give it up. Keep on going. In verse 12. And we beseech you brethren. To know or to appreciate them which labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. Those who teach you, those who preach to you, those who are trying to lead you as brothers and sisters in Christ. Appreciate them. The most criticism that I've ever heard experienced in life was that that I received when I was pastoring churches by church members. I think Brother Johnston mentioned this not too long ago. What's going on in churches? It's easier to complain about something, isn't it? Than to say, wait a minute, maybe I should have been listening and paying attention to what I've been told. Maybe he's not as bad as what I think he is. Verse 13 says, to esteem or to respect them very highly in love. Why? For their work's sake. That way you can be at peace with yourself. Because you're doing what God wants you to do. You got to remember, Paul's not telling them something that he just sucked out of his head. These are the things that he was told to pass on to these people. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn or admonish them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, the weak people. Support the weak, those who need help or support in the different areas of life. Be patient with all men. See that done render evil for evil. I'll get evil. Paul says, no, no. That's a no, no. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Praise God. Pray. 
continually without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. You know, we can learn a good lesson by looking at the life that I'm going to try not to get into, Brother Johnson's message tonight. He might be getting into some of this. But in Psalm 78, 41 and 42, we read, Yea, they, speaking of the Israelites, God's people, they turned back and tempted God, and listen to this, and limited the Holy One of Israel. God had a purpose for them. God had given them a promise that they would just follow Him. God wanted the best for them. But they stopped it by being disobedient and they died in the desert instead of in the land flowing with milk and honey. Why? They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. We look at a problem here but we forget how God got us out back here. Despise not prophesying or words of instruction or exhortation or warning that was being presented by the prophets and the teachers and the, the uh, ones that were presenting the word of God to them. Prove all things. Make sure they're right. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from things that you think aren't okay. No. Abstain from all appearances of evil. If it calls a question in your mind, whether it's good or bad, you know it could be the Holy Spirit giving you a message. The very peace of God sanctify or separate you from the profane or vulgar things. You holy. And I pray God your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved or found to be blameless or to be spotless without blemish until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are we? There. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. He said, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtly, cunningness, slightest, tricky ways, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it or fulfill his promise. Hebrews 10 37 says, For yet, a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. I've had people tell me, oh, I just hope that the Lord waits for a little while more because I have this loved one out there. Folks, he's not going to wait for anybody. When the time is up, it's up. Instead of worrying about those, we ought to be going to them and talking to them and explain what we know to them so they can have the same hope that we have. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and it shall not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Is God going to fail us in these promises? No. 
Titus 1 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. gainsayers. Hebrews 6 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, looking ahead. Looking ahead. And he closes, brother, pray for us. Pray for those who teach me. Pray for those who preaches God's word to me. I don't see anything in here where it says criticize those people. Nothing in here says turn your back on those people because they will come up to my standard. Brother, I want to tell you something. I don't care what your standard is. I care what my God's standard is. And it's my responsibility to do everything that I possibly can by following His Spirit to try every day to meet that standard. And I fail sometimes. Maybe more than not. As pastors and teachers, this has one important responsibility that we have. And Paul says, I charge you to these people by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Paul wrote to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Otherwise, Timothy, you preach the word, whether it's convenient or not. You preach the word, whether you're going to face problems, trials, or tribulation. You preach the word. You're right. Those would be wrong. Don't preach to make people happy in themselves. Preach the word so that they can be happy in Christ. Let's stand.